Or have they mastered a craft? Yes, all these people might have a gift, but that gift was practiced over and over and over again. Many hours were spent perfecting their talent. Many hours, painful hours, practiced repeatedly. It's the same for the Christian. We need to practice having time with God in reading. You see, if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are justified, acquitted, and not guilty of past sin. Last week, we heard Mike say, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. So justification describes the position of acceptance with God, which he gives us when we trust him as Christ our Savior. But there's another word when we speak of justification, and that is sanctification. Now, this is the process by which justified Christians are changed into the likeness of Christ. So justification concerns our outward status of acceptance with God, where sanctification concerns our inward growth of holiness and character. Now, there's one major difference between the two. Justification happens just once, whereas sanctification is gradual and ongoing. As a sports person, golfer, artist practices each day, it is our duty to grow in faith and knowledge of Jesus. It's been said that it takes 25 years for a person to reach full and to reach full physical and emotional maturity, but it can take a lifetime to reach spiritual maturity. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 says, he refers to new Christians as mere infants in Christ. He continues by saying, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for solid food. It has also been said that hundreds of people in the church today have not graduated from the nursery. I am sure that we know many people who have attended a Christian event, made a commitment to Christ, only to fizzle out and leave the church before they get their feet under the table, feeling that they have been let down. You see, joining a church is an important milestone especially if we view it as a new beginning rather than an end. In 1942, after the successful conclusion of the Battle of El Alamein in Egypt, Winston Churchill was quoted as saying, Gentlemen, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but uh, perhaps it is the end of the beginning. Now, in the New Testament, we read of four main areas in which the New Testament writers expect Christian growth to take place. And we will look at each one in turn. You see, firstly, we are to grow in faith. Faith for the Christian is like a hand fitting a glove. We often are referred to as believers. And Jesus himself called a disciple, disciple, one who follows me. But what is faith? Faith is the opposite to superstition. Faith is trust. So Christians are believers because they have put their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and because they have taken God at his word and rely on his promises. Faith is not static. It should be living and growing. Once Jesus rebuked his Apostle saying, you of little faith. But later he said, if they had faith as small as a mustard seed, then they could accomplish great things for God. On another occasion, they came to Jesus and said, increase our faith. And twice he speaks of the great faith of the Gentiles. So we can begin to see then, 
that there are different levels of faith. And we are to progress from infants to adults. And as we read and meditate on the Bible and of God's character, putting his promises to the test, our faith will ripen and grow. Sadly, for those who gave up at the first hurdle, they failed to grow in faith. Whereas what Paul wrote in his letter to the Thessalonians ought to be true for us all. Your faith is growing more and more. Second, we are to grow in love. Jesus brought together the Old Testament commands to love God with all our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Whereas Paul declared love to be the fulfillment of law, he also said, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of them all is love. The reason for this is that God is love and has set his love upon us. In fact, we love because he first loved us. Sadly, not all Christians, or in fact churches, display love towards each other. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, told them they were worldly and babyish because of jealousy and quarreling. You must question what he might say about some churches today. For we should be a sacrificial, serving, and supportive church with love for each other as well as the community around us. Here again, we need to take notice of Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica. You do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. He also prayed that their love would increase and flow, and that should be our prayer too. Thirdly, we are to grow in knowledge. It is so important that Christians grow in knowledge. John Stott is quoted as saying, whenever the heart is full and the head is empty, dangerous fanaticisms arise. Paul emphasizes this in many of his letters. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, in your thinking be adults. In fact, numerous times he begins with, I do not want you to be ignorant, or I want you to know. Sometimes he wrote, but don't you know, implying that if his readers did know, they would behave differently. Even in Paul's prayers for his converts, he says, may they know. However, we must know that for the Hebrews, the concept of knowing goes beyond understanding to experiencing. And this is especially true of the knowledge of God. You see, knowing God in Jesus Christ is the essence of being a Christian. And that means having a personal relationship with him. And that relationship needs to be active and growing. If it's not nurtured, it will wither and die. Again, Paul leads by example, saying, the unsurpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord, as well as saying his chief ambition is to know Christ and to enter ever more deeply into his sufferings, his death and resurrection power. So what he desires for himself, he desires for others too praying that they might be continuously growing in the knowledge of God. And Peter shares the same longing to his readers. He says that they should grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fourthly is holiness. For we are to grow in holiness. And growth in holiness is the process of sanctification. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, writes, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, 
who is the Spirit. Now, within that verse lies four vital lessons. First, holiness is Christ-likeness. And sanctification is the process of being transformed. There's an old Christian chorus which says, like Jesus, like Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. I love him so. I want to grow like Jesus day by day. Secondly, sanctification is a gradual process. And while some old habits will drop away quickly when we ask Jesus into our lives, others such as temper, lust, selfishness, they take longer. Thirdly, holiness is the work of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit is holy, it is his desire to promote his holiness through us. You see, the secret of sanctification is not that we struggle to live like Christ, but that Christ comes by his Spirit to live in us. Now I'm paraphrasing Bishop William Ward of London in saying, Christian character is not gained by acquiring difficult virtues from without, but rather by the Christ-like life from within. So if the Holy Spirit is to do his work of transforming us with ever-increasing glory, our role is, with unveiled faces, to consider and reflect the glory of the Lord. And in seeking him, we will naturally worship him. John Stott also writes, So to change the metaphor, we must let the divine potter have his way with us so that he can fashion out the poor clay of our fallen nature, a beautiful vessel fit for his use. Or changing the metaphor again, we may say that the carpenter from Nazareth is still busy with his tools. Now by the chisel of pain, now by the hammer of affliction, now by the plane of adverse circumstance, as well as through experiences of joy, he is shaping us into an instrument of righteousness. In my office, I have a plant on the window shelf. It's a lemon plant, which absorbs the sun that shines upon it. But it also absorbs the water that I feed it twice a week. Plants need water, light, and carbon dioxide to survive. Those common elements, along with soil, enable it to grow healthily. Take one out and it dies, but equally, too much of one thing can do the same. Being a Christian has its responsibilities too. When we first met with Christ, we knew little. We were fed with milk, not solid food, and as new babies crave your spiritual milk, we too must grow into maturity. So our birth must be followed by growth. We too must be fed and watered to grow. In fact, it is our Christian duty to God that we should know him more intimately. And generations of Christians have found out that is the best way, or what is the best way. And the best way is to read the Bible and pray. This is essential for Christian growth. And we should take time out of our busy lives to do this. It seems logical, but why do we do it? It's because God speaks to us through the Bible while we speak to him through prayer. Pray before you read, asking the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and bring light to your mind. Don't just read it, reread it. Reread the passage. Prayer will follow naturally. You can speak back to God on the topic which he has spoken to you. 
And my advice is don't change the conversation. If God has said something that has touched your heart, he has said it to get your attention. So let him speak to you more. If he has spoken to you of himself and his glory, worship him. If he has spoken to you about yourself and your sins, confess them. And thank him for any blessings that may have been revealed to you. You might even want to write a prayer diary detailing your days and events and run through them again in the evening, confessing your sins that you may have committed while giving thanks for the blessings you have received. But we also have a duty to the church. You see, the Christian life is not a private one we are born into God's family. So not only has God become our father, but every believer in the world is our brother and sister. Whatever denomination, they are still brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't you just love it when you go for a walk or you're in a foreign country? In fact, you could be anywhere. And you find out that you're with another Christian you're talking to somebody, and they share their faith. Your spirit connects with theirs, and you have this mutual love and bond. Now, you would expect me to say this, but it's important to be part of a church. Using the plant illustration again, the church is the soil where you will grow and be rooted. And I would say that baptism should follow. If you've not been baptized as a believer, Please speak to me afterwards. I sometimes wonder why Christians see baptism as an option. You see, most Christians don't have a problem taking communion. So why not be baptized? It is our duty, too, to look outside the church, to serve our community. Over the centuries, the church has a fight record of meeting the needs of the poor, the hungry, of life's casualties. But there is much more to be done. And sometimes we have to admit with shame that others seem to have more compassion and love than us who should know more. As we've been hearing in recent weeks, we have another responsibility as Christians. We are to evangelize and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to be witnesses to our family, friends, work colleagues, living, consistent, loving, humble, honest, and Christ-like lives. That example will attract others to hear what we have to share. So how do we do that? Always begin with prayer. Ask God to give you a special concern for someone, and I would say someone of the same sex as you. Pray for the right words to say to them, and spend time with them. In time, you will have the opportunity to share something of your testimony with them and what Jesus means to you. We must live life worthy of the name we claim to be. We must read and pray regular, be loyal and regular in our attendance at church while being in Christian service and witness. I'm also going to add, we should also attend a home group, grow together in fellowship, love, and grace. When I wrote this on one of my other window ledges, I have a daily reading page. And the words that I'm going to read to you is from the Message Translation. It says, But you are chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. That's taken from 1 Peter 2. This is the call to commitment. This is expected of us serving Christ here in Amesbury and the world. 
only by following these examples will we strive to be like the sports person, the artist, the pianist. Jesus died and rose again so that we could have a new life. And he has given us his spirit so that we can live out this life in his world. So let us follow him and give ourselves freely and completely to his service. Amen.